Hey guys, I'm here today to do my August and September reading wrap up. So I've mentioned in my most recent video that I've been going through the process of buying and sort of renovating and moving into a new house, or an old house I should say, but new to me and to Johnny. And so I haven't been reading loads and I also have been reading rubbish with the channel. So I, I think I've read like 12 or 13 books across the two months of August and September and quite a few of them were rereads on audio so not like loads of super new to me books but I didn't want to completely ignore the fact that I had read them because actually I read quite a few books that I really really loved so I thought I would spend the time in this video talking about all those books. Now they're all in boxes because I've only unpacked my unread books which you can see behind me. The rest of this room is a complete mess but Johnny and I have managed to um, put the computer desk in this tiny little corner surrounded by boxes and then put my unread books on these shelves behind us so we've at least got some things that we need but everything else is just chaos but you don't need to see that. So I just have my phone so I can go on the Goodreads app and just see what I read and I'm literally going to go through them um, in the order from the ones I read right at the start of August to the ones I read at the end of September. So Firstly, I reread a book and I listened to it, and that is Normal People by Sally Rooney. So I read that book last year in 2018, and it was one of my favourite books of the year. I did a whole video chatting about it, which I'll link up here, and I absolutely adored it. And I stumbled across it on, I think, on script, on audio, and I thought, you know what, this will be a really interesting one to listen to on audio. And the main reason for that is because if you don't know already, Normal People like very simple explanation here, is about two sort of late teen, early 20 somethings who um, go to school together and then go to university together in Dublin. And they are a girl and a boy and they have this sort of on again, off again, quite toxic, yet filled with love and understanding relationship that you follow throughout the novel. And the audiobook has a um, male and a female narrator for both of their voices. And I think I love listening to audiobooks when they're rated by more than one person, obviously when they're done well, but also when it's an accent that is something other than my own. And I think these audiobook narrators were amazing. Now, it's an odd one because obviously I love this novel so much, it's always a scary one to revisit. And because it's such a deep emotional connection, I think in a way, whilst the audiobook is amazing and the narrators do such a good job, I preferred this book when I read it and it was in my voice because it's such a, a thoughtful book that reading it yourself at your own pace in your own tone allows you to truly deeply connect and I think the audiobook perhaps removes you from that a little bit. So I still love this book but what I will say is that I struggled a bit more with the male lead than I did the first time around. Now the male lead is not super likeable but I think I found him more difficult when I listened in in audiobook form and maybe that's because it's the second time I've read it so I, I knew what was going to happen so I was judging him more harshly or maybe that was because the audiobook narrator did such a good job that actually he made me realise you know how much of an ass he was and that doesn't take away from my enjoyment of the book but it made it a little bit more difficult for me to get through because it was frustrating. So still love it, I think it's an amazing book, I think she's an amazing writer but I don't think I, I got quite the same level of, of enjoyment out of it as I did the first time but perhaps that's never going to happen. So there's that. Then I was sent this book in the post and I read it on the day it arrived and it's called I Go Quiet by David Umet. Sorry, I should have checked that. I'll put a picture of it up here. So it's an absolutely beautiful book and it's a picture book, but I guess it's one of those picture books that could be for children or could be for adults. I wish I had the actual copy to hand. I've no idea which box it's in. It's about a... Um, little girl in this really bleak depressing world that is, is really feels really regimented and she she's quiet she's an introvert it's about how she is as an introvert and she moves through the pages of this book and they all wear these little masks and she always looks just slightly different and she's always on the outskirts of the picture and you know the the, the idea is that she she reads and she gets lost in words and the, the um, conclusion, which I don't think is a spoiler because it's a tiny picture book, is that she she isn't quiet when she's within books because it makes her feel loud and brave and there's all these stories and all these words and it's a place where um, she's the least quiet she could possibly be. It's beautiful. I, I guess I don't know if I'd have enjoyed it as a child because it is a bit depressing, but as an adult I can um, 
see the beauty in it and I, I thought it was lovely so I definitely recommend that. Then one of my absolute favourite reads of the year has been Always You Adina by VG Lee. So this is a novel that is set in 1960s Birmingham and we are told the story from the perspective of a young girl called Bonnie. I think she's about 11 or 12 years old um, for the majority of this novel and I loved it. So I picked this up in Gaze the Word and I was drawn in by the rather spectacular cover and they had a few of VG Lee's books there and I, I liked the sound of all of them but I thought I'd go for this one mainly because you may know if you've watched my channel for any length of time I love novels told from a young girl's perspective and this is the perfect example of why. Now not everybody would love this novel. This is um, slice of life it's really focused on the small details not a ton happens and it's this small family drama um, and there's so many things that I love about this. So I love that it's focused on a young girl um, character. I love um, ch children of a certain age and they tell the story because they don't understand everything you understand and this is the perfect example of that. So the main driver of this story is that she has an aunt who um, they call Adina Aunt Ed and she is absolutely beautiful and she's um, vivacious and loud and charismatic and everybody adores her except for Bonnie's mother. So Bonnie's mother is the opposite of Adina in every way really. Um, she's quiet, she's dowdy, um, she, she doesn't talk unless it's to be negative and so people find her a bit tiresome really. So Bonnie um, builds her up and builds her up throughout the novel but we as, as our adult readers see the truth in the comparison between these two women and the, the complete unfairness of it and throughout the novel you're aware that the relationship between Bonnie's father and her aunt is not normal and the way her mother is expected to deal with that is also not normal and as the novel goes on you find out more about Aunt Adina and I'm not going to spoil any of that there's a lot more that I could say and I'm not going to say it because I think finding out about her the character is such a, a wonderful journey to go on yourself and as you as you unravel all this stuff about Aunt Adina you find out more about everybody else you find out more about Bunny's mother and father her grandmother her uncle her cousin and it's just a beautiful story. It's a, an amazing um, sort of, um, it, it encaptures um, a working class family life in the 1960s. Um, I thought it captured the neighborhood beautifully. So I guess this, if you like stuff like The Trouble with Goats and Sheep by Joanna Cannon, this is sort of in that field. Um, it's a child around the same age, around the same era, around the same class. It's a family story, but there's a lot more darkness to this and I, and it's a closer story. So with The Trouble of Goats and Sheep, um, there's two friends and they're focused on something that's happened to a neighbour. This is much closer to home. I absolutely loved it and I will now read anything and everything that VG Lee has or will write. So I'd really recommend it. Then I read The Best We Could Do, an illustrated memoir by T. Bui. I should have double checked. I watched loads of videos of her afterwards because I, I found it a really interesting graphic novel. So I've heard loads of people rave about this. I don't think I need to talk about this um, too much because I think it's really popular um, and I've heard lots of people recommend it and that was what eventually got me to, to pick it up and give it a go. So this is a memoir. My favourite type of um, graphic books are memoirs. I think it's a, a beautiful way to tell your life story. Um, and this focuses on the author's um, family's history of how her and all of her siblings were born in Vietnam and how they moved across the US with her parents and she really dives into her family's history and what happened before she was born, how they met um, and she, she goes back into loads of things she didn't necessarily understand as a child and I thought it was really well done. I love the colour palette, it's sort of um, browns and oranges, all that sort of um, tones. I, I don't love the drawing style, I think it's good, but it's not the sort of drawing style I really enjoy, but I think it really worked for the story. And I definitely recommend this one. I thought it was a really strong graphic memoir. Not my favorite, um, but I can see why loads of people rave about it. And I would you know, follow her career and, and look forward to whatever else she brings out. The next we have Sea of Seven Waters by Juliet Marillia. I'm not gonna say much about this because it's the fifth book in the Seven Waters series, of which there are six books. And I will probably do a, um, a video about all six of them when, I've, when I finally get to the last one. 
Yeah, I mean, so I guess this, each story is a standalone um, historical fantasy romance story and the first couple were amazing and then the last couple have been meh, and then this one was bad, like not very good at all. I almost DNF'd it. Um, I carried on because it was audio and I was like, I might as well just finish it, but it's not great. And there's part of me that thinks I may be, it's hard, isn't it? And I never know what to recommend because ultimately it's other people's decisions. But when, when you're reading a series, and you do read them all and you realise that actually if you'd stopped on the second or third book in a six book series then all you'd have remembered was greatness and you'd have had a really wonderful relationship with it then maybe that would have been the better option but I know if someone else told me don't carry on and read the final three I still always would because I'd want to experience it myself and make that cool myself so I wouldn't say that to others but I think just be aware that in my mind the level of the story making sense, um, the main characters being well developed and um, just everything, the pace, the writing, everything suffers in the later books. So I'm hoping book six will be, you know, a step up from book five. Um, but yeah, I didn't think it was very good. So there's that one. Then we have My Brother's Husband, volume one by, let me double check, Gengora Tagami. And I heard loads of people talk about this one and my library had it. So I got it out and I read it in one sitting of an evening. And, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I, I gave this one like three stars, I think. It's enjoyable, it's fun, it's nice, but it's not doing anything groundbreaking, I don't think. And perhaps it, it, I can see why it's really important in the country it is from. But I guess as a, as a British reader, it's, it's not so sort of, um, so much a big deal. And actually the themes it tackles, it tackles quite lightly. Um, and it's not too challenging, I don't think. So it's enjoyable, it's nice, but I don't think it's anything like absolutely spectacular. But then these sort of um, graphic novels aren't really the, the sort of ones I tend to go for. So um, I was always going in at a, um, you know, less likelihood of loving it like other people have. So I enjoyed it. I've got volume two of the library. I think, you know, um, they're nice, but they're not anything, you know, spectacular in my mind. The next one I absolutely loved, one of the absolute best books I've read this year, if not the best. I have to look through and, and see what else I've read but I thought it was brilliant and that's Good Talk, a memoir and conversations by Mira Jacob. I'm gonna have to reread this and I think I'm gonna actually get it out of the library again before the end of the year and read it because I just thought it was phenomenal and I feel like I'm not gonna be able to give it the amount of time I want to here so I think I will um, reread it and talk about it again at another point. So this is what it says it is. It's a memoir in conversations and the way this graphic novel is set out, I'm gonna to have to try and find a couple of photos to show you because it's really hard to describe. So the backdrop is always actual photos. And then um, what the author has done is she's drawn um, like dull cutouts of herself and all the people in her life. And she, she places them over real things or real photos or maps, things like that. And then takes a photo of it. So you're seeing this overlay of um, these cutout images of herself and perhaps her child or her husband or her friends over these actual photos and their facial expressions don't change. So she has a f most people, there's only one cutout of each of them, but people like herself, her child, her husband, you get a few different cutouts as they age or if they're in different um, outfits, but their faces never change. And I thought that was brilliant. So this book is about um, difficult conversations she's had with the people in her life, mainly to do with race and how that affects her life and, and how she views the world in lots of different ways. So um, a couple of sort of three big, big themes, I guess, um, of that is that um, her family moved over from India and she has always been very much aware when she goes back to visit her extended family in India that they find the tone of her skin unattractive and they make racist comments about it. So she's very dark um, skinned and her family make her aware of that and they will say things in her earshot that she's never considered before that things like she's gonna find it difficult to find a husband he'll have her, she's gonna to have to take what she can get, um, oh, she's such a beautiful girl, it's a shame about her skin, things like that. And her parents don't feel this way at all and so when she tries to have conversations with them about it, it it's difficult because they're trying to shield her whilst not really explaining um, the reasons that her extended family feel that way um, and 
and in, in doing so in not having those conversations I guess it makes her feel alone in the way she feels so that's one example of what, she, what goes through the the book another is that her um her son has um her as his mother and then his father is white Jewish and so he's sort of conflicted about whether he's um, brown or white and he um, sort of comes across Michael Jackson's story and becomes really obsessed with Michael Jackson and starts to ask her a lot of questions about what race Michael Jackson is, what that means for him um, and when um, lots of things happen with, with Trump her in-laws vote for Trump and she finds that really difficult and she tries to have conversations with them about it and how that makes her feel and they just won't and um, her young son knows about that and it makes him think that maybe his grandparents don't love him because how can they vote for somebody who doesn't like brown people when he himself is brown it is amazing it's so raw it's so honest and as well as being just intelligent articulate fascinating it's also hilarious in a really horrible way now i some of my favorite non-fiction thinking of things like the inconvenient indian by thomas king are the same in that they're so intelligent so articulate so devastating but yet caustically funny to the point where you're smirking at something or chuckling at something that's vile but the authors managed to do that to bring you in in a way where you get these moments of humour in an otherwise sad book but the moments of humour also make you feel shit because they make you feel sort of hopeless um, and this book isn't hopeless the way it ends she pulls it together I just think everybody should read it I think it's the the way it's set out is like the best way a graphic memoir in my mind could be set out there's no better way she could have done this and I just thought it was brilliant um, and I've since got one of her novels out from the library and I'm hoping to pick that up soon and I just think everybody should read this so please do. So the next one I'm going to talk about is The Tricking of Freya by Christina Sunley. So I've owned this for quite a few years because I bought lots of novels that were set in cold locations and just haven't read most of them. I'll link that book call up here in case you're interested. And I finally got to this one and it's one of those books that I did enjoy but I think I won't really remember much about and if I knew that Christina suddenly had another novel out. I'd probably pick it up if I thought the premise was really intriguing. If I thought the premise was just like all right, I probably wouldn't be desperate to pick it up because I didn't think her writing was amazing. So I enjoyed it, but maybe not like I didn't, I don't know if it's like a four star, it's probably somewhere between a three and a four. So the main premise of this, and there's loads of things I'll say about this now which make it sound like a book I could love, so I don't know what quite made it not so spectacular. Um, this um, young girl who we follow grows up with her mother in the US and for a long, long time she doesn't meet her relatives who live in a small village in Canada which has been settled by Icelandic immigrants, of which they are. And so when she gets to be around 11 I think she actually finally meets them and her aunt Birdie is sort of obsessed with her and she becomes absolutely obsessed, infatuated, in love with her Aunt Birdie. And we know as adult readers that her Aunt Birdie isn't quite as amazing as she thinks. Sounds a little bit like always you Adina at this point. Something rather tragic happens which changes the, the story and we know she's telling this um, story as now a woman in her late 20s who's going back having not been there for many many years and we know she's on the lookout for a cousin she believes she has and she's trying to look into her aunt's history to try and find out who this cousin is and she's writing the novel as though she's talking to the cousin as though you are the cousin so um, there's parts of this novel that are set in um, this small village there's other parts that are set in Iceland um, and there's lots of Icelandic history involved lots of characters who have a real um, tie to the history and the art and the culture of Iceland, which I, I enjoyed all of that. I guess what I didn't love, I think the actual plot, I feel like even from what I've just said, which is literally the blurb, you could probably figure out the like the plot twist. Um, but I guess that doesn't take away from it. But so yeah, I enjoyed this, but I just, I don't have a ton to say about it. Okay, so my battery just died, so I have no idea. If it looks different now, like the camera's shifted, so sorry if it has. So the next one is Almost Love by Louise O'Neill. I got this one out from the library and I read it in like two sittings and it's an odd one. So you probably know what this story is about. We follow a young woman who has been in a rather toxic relationship. She's now in a good relationship, but she's looking back on that toxic relationship where she was 
um, seeing a man who was a bit older than her and who kept their lives very separate. So they only ever met in hotel rooms for sex. He didn't treat her very well at all. And she always thought there was gonna be more from it. And it's just really about this toxic relationship. And so you have moments in the present where she's with her new partner and you have moments in the past where she, she shows you how she really lost everybody because of the way she became infatuated with this man. So it's quite a dark novel, it's quite bleak. And it was an interesting one. So I found it a massive page turn. I read it in two sittings and I really wanted to finish it. And I found it interesting in that the main character isn't likeable, but obviously you sympathise with her because of what she's going through. But she treats her friends and her family horribly. Um, she, she comes across as really selfish. Um, there are certain moments in their lives when they need her and she just doesn't care. She doesn't have the energy to connect or to give anything back because she's so focused on what's happening to her. So it's hard. I did sympathise with her, but I saw some people's reviews where they said they really couldn't connect to the novel because they so disliked her. I don't think someone being... Because I think, actually, initially I thought what I was going to get from this novel was that she's selfish and um, like that because of this relationship. And actually, I don't think that's the case. I think she was always a little bit like that. And there was a couple of really interesting conversations she had with her partner's mother about that which were quite harsh but I found really um really illuminating so I enjoyed this I enjoyed it more in the moment but I think when I finished it I was sort of left thinking okay that's done and I think it's done what it's out to do but I don't think it's done anything really new in that type of story and I just don't think it really pulled together brilliantly at the end. Um, so I think it was, um, yeah, I think it, it set up all the building blocks to to be great. And then it, I don't know how it could have ended, but I, I don't know, I just felt like it fizzled out a little bit. So I enjoyed it. I sped through it. I will read more of her books. I've actually got another one of her books out from the library. This is the sort of book, had I read when I was about 15, 16, I would have absolutely loved. And actually I did read a book that was sort of similar to this when I was that age called Mr. Perfect, I think it was called. I'll see if I can find the cover and put it here. And I read that book so many times and I was obsessed with it. It's quite a similar um, idea. I just think that now I read these sort of novels and think, God, I would have loved this if I'd read it when I was this age. And I'm just not that age anymore. So although I think this is written for adults, but she in general writes for teenagers and I think it shows in this book. So yeah, didn't love it, but I think it's a good book. Then I did love Heartstopper Volume 1 by Alice Osman. Osman, not quite sure how you say it. So I had heard a few people talk about this and I checked, my library had it, so I reserved it and it took ages because I think everyone must be loving it, rightly so. And it is a graphic novel about a, um, an, all -boys, an all boys school and we follow um, one character who is openly gay and is also very much liked. Um, so after he um, sort of came out, sort of, as gay, lots of people turned against him and then now he's just really popular everyone likes him and he is invited to join the um the rugby club at school and to join the rugby team by um this older really popular guy and really sort of stereotypical um masculine guy and they start to get on really well and it's just really watching that friendship and possible romance develop and it's just a really quiet story about that a couple of small things happen um but but mainly it's to do with what it's like to um, to come out as gay in that sort of environment and what it's like to present yourself as a straight person and to be friends with a gay person and how teenagers deal with that and how they feel it gives them the right to um, assess um, what your sexuality may be and it's just beautiful it's a not loads happens but it's just a lovely warm story and I found whenever I was turning the page I was smiling and even talking about it now I'm smiling and I've been waiting for ages for volume two to um, come on to my um, reserve shelf at the library because there's a big queue but I um, really enjoyed it so I definitely recommend it and I just think it's really heartwarming. Then I re-listened to Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. We were doing lots of decorating and I just wanted something to listen to. Bloody loved it and I'm currently on the um, Prisoner of Azkaban and just, yeah, I'm really liking 
listening to them now we're in the new house because I think it's really grounding me in this being home by um, reading Harry Potter so that's lovely and then right at the end of the month I decided to pick up another book by the author of Heartstopper um, because I really enjoyed it and I picked up Solitaire because I, I knew it was about the sister of the main character in Heartstopper so I again read it in two sittings and I sort of wish I hadn't carried on to begin with, I was like, mm, this isn't, I don't think she's as good in novel form. Like obviously graphic novels, there's way less words and she's just not so good with all that. And then I, I just carried on and actually it became a real mess of a novel. It's about, um, we followed this teenage girl at school who hates life, is really depressed, um, isn't particularly nice, to be honest. She's quite um, selfish and, and focused on, she's quite cruel and judgmental towards people who are her friends, which is odd and she sort of builds this relationship with these two guys and and there's also this online blog called solitaire which keeps sending her private messages and she's trying to figure out what's going on there i didn't care about solitaire um she'd do really odd things like she'd have a really great day out with this friend and think god this is a really great friendship blossoming and then you'd be like okay the next chapter is obviously going to be them seeing each other at school the next day and like the, the, the relationship continuing to develop and then she'd just ignore him for days and there'd be no real reason for it like i don't i don't feel like the author really articulated why the character was doing that and that happened loads and um, just these these things that just didn't make sense and i felt like the whole novel just didn't make sense um the the plot she obviously wanted to, to prove some sort of point about this character, but it didn't work. Um, and just all of her actions to me were bizarre. Um, the idea of solitaire was bizarre. You got this big reveal at the end, and then like 10 minutes after the reveal, like someone who really should have been in a lot of trouble, it was just like, what ifs? Uh, yeah, odd. So I, I might try another one of her books because actually I've looked into the plot of the others and maybe this was just the wrong one to go for. So let me know if you've read lots of her books and you think I should still try another. Maybe it's just only her graphic novels work for me, but I thought it was a bit of a mess of a novel and I also thought um, we were trying to be given this sort of like manic pixie dream girl like I'm the interesting one like I don't involve myself in like fads I don't follow the crowd but actually she just became this really mean judgmental person which I don't think um, and you were supposed to not think that I think and so I don't think she was a great um, representation of a more individual teenage girl in all honesty so because, you know, it, as a teenage girl, I may have read that and thought she was really cool and thought it was really cool that she was so witty and made horrible remarks about her friends. Um, so I just don't think that's a great um, thing to say as an author to, to teenagers. I, th I think it shows a lack of responsibility. So, yeah, didn't love it. So, but I did love loads of these. So uh, this has been really long. I thought it would be shorter, but actually it's reminded me how great some of these books were. So um, do feel free to chat about them down below and let me know if you've read any of them. And um, I just, uh, yeah, love to know your thoughts. And also always feel free to recommend me books about young girls or graphic memoirs, because I love both of those things, as you probably know. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.